Christmas festival to help focus people through, you know, this crazy past year we've had. Mm -hmm. And having someone like yourself, Kiko, and uh, Vance Burberry last year as our cinematographer, um, judge and the director's duo makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And it kind of legitimizes what we're doing. It adds this extra interesting flavor to it. Um, So thank you for that uh, straight off the bat. For having me. Um, Yeah, I want to kind of start things, you know, in a relatively straightforward way. Um, when what was the point where you were drawn into designing movie posters? Because obviously you've had a an art background, or was it a fine art background? But what was the point? What was the kind of tipping point? Was it uh, someone approached you? Uh, was it through a company you worked for? Um, it was uh, purely accidental. Um, I was doing editorial illustration in New York, and I came back to uh, Los Angeles, and I had so much debt racked up my student loans were were knocking on my door and um, a good girlfriend of mine was working at a movie poster advertising agency and so um, they were looking for a receptionist so I actually interviewed uh, for that job and um, I actually met with one of the owners and while I was in my interview I just brought a spin magazine that one of my illustrations was in and I showed it to him at the same time. I don't even know why I did that, but I just wanted to show him what I, what I was doing up until that point. And he said, what are you doing? Thinking that you're going to be answering phones. Why don't you try making posters? And um, up until that point, I barely used a computer. I was using it just for checking emails. So I had very limited knowledge, even in Photoshop, other than what I learned as, as kind of a, a base of Photoshop uh, in, in, in my design school, but I never really used it. And um, they tried me out as a junior designer and um, I had about three months probation with them where I just kept messing up and I don't know how I didn't get fired every day. But um, eventually after those three months, um, they decided to take me on full time and um, everything I learned was on the job and being thrown into the fire. And um, yeah, the rest was history from that point on. Yeah, it's what I've, what I really appreciate is um, I've, I've picked up your book about a week ago. And, oh, thank you. Uh, there's a couple of comments from uh, Bryce Dallas Howard and John Tolbert, especially. Uh, and I completely agree what John says about, uh, Joe, so, uh, sorry, said about, um, yeah, your, your works from the heart of the film. And when you see your the artwork from your posters, like I just watched a Cop Car, uh, great film with Kevin Bacon. Yeah, and when you see the poster, it it really pictures those two boys that find the police car with the energy of the car jumping over the hill. And that's represented, I think, across the board in your movie posters. There isn't any kind of, oh, that doesn't really represent that because you see that in some movie posters and... And it's a really terrible representation of what's actually on screen, mm-hmm. as though they've never seen the film. Like, the worst example I've seen is a film called Rain of Fire with Matthew McConaughey and Christian Bale, where it's, it's this epic fire scene over London. You go and see the movie, and it's just a very one second shot from a flashback. And it doesn't represent the film in any way. But I'd say your work, it's really nice to see that consistency through it the kind of honesty of the the heart of the film, you know, it's really quite nice. Well, thank you. I mean, um, going back to what you said about that poster, how you felt tricked into seeing that movie. I mean, that isn't necessarily that's part of the work, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that the, is, that's the point. But, yeah. But um, I think, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily fall on the designer's shoulders. That, that could also be the marketing team behind trying to get this movie to be seen. So sometimes, you know, it is smoke and mirrors to get um, somebody to sit, sit down and watch it. But, you know, that's also the fun part of the job is that um, we are having to kind of navigate through these marketing directives and still try to come up with something clever and eye catching at the same time. And, and, and when that happens, we're, we're really excited when we can push something a little less conventional through. Yeah. So with that's... your creative freedom, when you are able to, or when you're commissioned for a, a movie poster, do you have something from the movie that you can work with? Do you get a preview? Are you reading scripts? Like, how do you um, begin your process for creating these posters and creating that's so much a part of the advertising part of it? 
Um, you know, it changes per project because I'm brought in at such different stages in the game of the film. Um, a lot of times um, they'll want to start getting some type of advertising out in the world to kind of tease a film before it's even shot. Right. Or they even cast people. So sometimes I'm only given a two line synopsis. So um, when there's sometimes there's nothing to work with at all. And so that's when my illustration skills come in handy because I'm really having to kind of generate something out of nothing. And I actually really love those projects the most because it's pretty open and, it, and you can get super creative and, and um, it, it's before so many things are kind of locked down. It's before actors need their face a certain percentage or their name a certain percentage on the poster. So um, oftentimes when there's the least amount to work with, that's, that's actually when I'm the most excited to be brought on. Um, but um, other times I'll be given a script. Um, maybe half of the time I'll get the screener, but um, a lot of times the screeners are without special effects or without music. So mm -hmm. you really get to see how much editing and music really make a film feel like a film as opposed to watching a play in a theater. So it, it's always fun to see the different stages of a film. Does that come with, uh, because you've worked with, I think it was uh, one or two, uh, two, some of these filmmakers more than once. Do you sometimes have a clearer picture because you've built up a rapport uh, with a filmmaker or through a company? Um, it depends. I mean, sometimes a filmmaker can can have a different studio representing that film. And just depending on the studio, I'll know that that studio wants to push something more broad or more, more mainstream. But um, I think I pretty much figure out what the tone of the poster is going to be by the studio more than the director. Because, you know, there are some directors I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. I, this is really going to be open to something, um, you know, out of the box and, and really left field. But then when I see the studio representing them, I'm like, oh, OK, but they're still going to want to market this to mm -hmm. a mainstream audience. So, you know, it's you have to kind of pay attention to those those little things. I mean, you still want to push better work, but but you know that with certain certain studios, you, you're, you're going to have a little bit more confinements than with others. Is that is that something that happened? I, I was reading your book where it says um, where your design for Under the Skin, where you had you had a, uh, a a certain amount of freedom, and then they kind of went away. It kind of left was left on the drawing board, kind of thing. Is that something that they're really happy with going forward with a design, and then it just like now we want to completely change it, and they go to a different design? Is that? Yeah, I mean that one was. Um interesting because I was working directly with the director and he Is that Jonathan Glazer, yeah. yeah he came to me and he's like I don't want stars I don't want the sky um you know let's let's go for something more creepy um you know um out of this world with this the skin texture which could also look supernatural but also feel like a NASA photo at the same time so we were really pushing that and then at the end of the day, the, the studio ended up with a poster of her face in the sky. So it, it's funny how those things happen. And again, it all comes down to marketing. So um, I, I don't take it too harshly. I, I know that it, it rarely has to do with the work and it's more about, you know, what some marketing team really feels um, fulfills what needs to happen to get people to see it. Um, so was it a slightly different process because for Nine Muses, was it Nine Muses Entertainment you designed the logo for? I did, I did. Was that a closer collaboration with Bryce Dallas Howard or was it? It was, it a... was. She was amazing to work with. Um, it was a really smooth process and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so used to uh, so many cooks in the kitchen and yeah. um, so many um, stages a, a piece has to go through, but she came in with a real clear um, idea that she wanted executed. So that, that made my job so easy. Is that, it's, sim it's similar to Under the Skin in some ways, because the Under the Skin's a, a UK quad poster, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I, what I didn't realize is I've got one of your posters somewhere in my collection because I used to be in Osher. So oh, wow. I, think, I think it's a Funny Games poster somewhere. Um, and yeah, the, the mural piece for Nine Muses, it's quite a wide image, isn't it? 
compared to a lot of the one sheets. Is that um, that's their, that's, that's basically what comes on before a film, you know, when they show the logos of the studio. So that's, that's, that's how we came up with that sizing. That's great. That, that must be something to be really proud of. And when I was looking through your book and looking at how you design things and looking at your overall uh, artwork, seeing those up, that up on screen must be great. But um, with, with having a uh, tangible work throughout your career, it must be great for someone like your son to see your work because so, so much kind of creative work or behind the scenes, like an editor, family members don't necessarily know what you've done. But when you see that artwork, you must be you must be quite proud of that. You can show that off. Yeah, hopefully one day, because right now all he sees are tubes downstairs in the in the basement. I saw that video. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of dusty tubes. One day I'll I'll whip them out and and show them to him. Yeah. Um, so I just want to go into a little bit of detail about the cop car um, poster. How did that come to be? Because it looked like a torn road. Was that supposed mm -hmm. to be like a a freeing experience for the kids. Is that what it represented? Um, well, let's see. When when I got put onto that project, there were a few ideas where I had that were um, based on the two children. And um, I actually pitched some illustration ideas as well. But um, when it came down to it, we really just scaled it back. And um, I think the, the director was pretty adamant about using a photograph. So, um, what we did is um, one of my favorite all-time posters is Downhill Racer. It's a Robert Redfoot film and it, they do a similar trick with the rip. And um, I just thought, hey, um, let's show this action shot, but let's make it feel a little bit more interesting so it doesn't feel like a mainstream action movie. Because as you saw in the film, it's more of a art. Yeah, it's like super minimal. And then, you know, yeah. it is very minimal. So I felt like the the poster had to kind of reflect the tone of the film. Yeah, so it's su really it's super. Film. Yeah, it's super efficient. That's what I get from the poster as well. That the films, it felt like a first time director, but not in a, a negative way. But it's really efficient use of the camera movement and everything. Um, and I couldn't help but laugh at Kevin Bacon running in that film, especially yeah. when he realizes he's lost the cop car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what I really liked about your book um, was the stages uh, that you show, and it's on your website as well, the different stages from beginning to end, mm -hmm. how you approach design. Um, has there ever been a point where you've designed something that's almost final then, and then you've gone back and redesigned it? Um, that's happened a few times. Um, I think what happens is that these deadlines get shorter and shorter. So once it starts getting to the 80% done, there's not much time to kind of restart the whole thing. And I think that it, they would rather kill it than kind of redo it or have somebody else do the poster. So, I mean, there's usually so many people working on the same project as I am. So, rather than kind of uh, revamp the whole thing, they might just go with somebody else's design. Does that affect how many layers you present in your poster in terms of the images and the themes presented in your posters? Um, what do you mean by that? Like so, how? Like in your posters from the ones that I've reviewed, there's so many layers in terms of for image, background images, textures, and the presentations of the characters. Um, when you feel as though you have those shorter deadlines or those limitations to what you can do, do you feel that that affects the meaning and the tone behind the layers that you could present in your poster? Oh, I mean, uh, from a more like technical side, you mean? As yeah, far as how the main... And also just how it is to possibly received by the general public. Yeah, I... He's on the work. Yeah, I mean, I think when I'm, I'm working on a file, I try to make it as flexible as possible because there are revisions that are needed along the way that sometimes if I had just scanned in one painting, trying to fix it, in Photoshop, it, it, it might just add, you know, sleepless nights. So as far as me making my actual files, I, I try to make them multi-layered so that, hey, if they want a different background, it's easy to switch out. Or if they want a color change, it's easier to switch out. And, and it does help with, especially with these crazy deadlines to just make sure my files are able to be malleable in, in a way where um, I'm not having to, you know, want to jump off a bridge because I asked for something impossible. So yeah, I mean, that's something I learned uh, over the years is just how to make my files to be ready for these client revisions because 
you know, as I mentioned before, I'm usually not the only person working on a project. And sometimes another person can be presenting a photographic based poster. And when the client is asking for a revision, they might just be asking for a simple tweak on a photographic version. But then for me doing an illustration, I have to be as quick as they are or else I'm out of the race. So um, it's just something I, I've learned over the years is how to really work efficiently and, and make my files able to keep up with the other ones that they're, you know, being, pre being presented with. Yeah. What I, um, what I especially loved was your, the initial designs for, is it um, Oliver Stone's uh, W? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, and the different ideas of the belt buckle. And I think it was a, was it like a pre presidential sealed version of him? And then yeah. it came down to a behind the scenes kind of photo kind mm -hmm. of thing. So yeah. what was that process like? So, um, you know, this was when I worked full time at a movie poster ad agency. And um, one of the things we had to do, because we knew we were going to get a photo shoot, which doesn't happen that often these days. But um, when they do happen, um, we art directors and we designers, we have to actually come up with concepts for the different setups in the actual photo shoot. So, you know, we all had a, a, a number of ideas that we presented to the client and they approved them to, to be shot. But um, in one, you know, when I was going through all of the photography, I saw this one shot and I was like, oh, well, I remember this George Lois uh, famous uh, magazine cover of Nixon getting kind of, he has like yeah. a lipstick, a powder coming in. And I'm like, well, why don't we sort of, you know, take cues from that? And so I was able to, to piece together from multiple um, other photographs that were behind the scenes for this photo shoot to, to make it make the scene. So I was really happy when that, that came together and even more happy when the client liked it and printed it. So um, I love when those happy accidents happen. You know? Yeah. It's super minimal and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a magical moment, isn't it? It was like these kind of soup little accidents kind of, uh, or you, a bit of serendipity. You can't, you can't predict it. And then it just, it, it feels as though it's always meant to be. Yeah. You know, that was the like, that was the original intention. But when you see the other designs, they were interesting too, but this seemed to be the right one at this point. Um, what's it like working with, because I know sometimes you don't necessarily work directly with the client. Uh, you might work with a kind of design studio. Uh, what's it like when you work with, say, uh, did you work directly with Paul Dano on his wildlife? Or is that I for did. a studio? That I worked with, uh, with, um ifc films instead and yeah. th what i love about that kind of art is it reminds me of some sort of i could ed hopper uh the art style it's mm -hmm. did you study portraiture uh before your career started oh yeah i mean it when i went to to art school there was a, a heavy focus on portraiture and getting likenesses you know i think um I was so happy I had that training because it was so beneficial when it came to me doing editorial illustration for music and entertainment magazines because I had to get certain celebrities likeness. So it was great how that kind of spilled over into to movie posters. But um, but yeah, I could see the Ed, Edward Hopper um, reference. Um, I think what I kind of took as influence, especially for that piece, was um, Eric White. He was one of my um, favorite painters when I was in school. So um, I definitely wanted to kind of take, especially tonality, like, um, like I wanted that kind of feeling for the fit, for the poster because I felt it fit the tone of yeah. the story. And, and that was one of those um, posters that we got, you know, I was working straight with the studio and we were 90% like sure that it was gonna get printed. And then at the last minute it, it got canned. But I'm still really proud of the piece, regardless. It is a really nice piece, and that's something that uh, you've got that, and now you can kind of show it off. And when a when a film's uh, about to be released, when can you show content like that through your book or online? So when when's the signing off point when you're allowed to kind of oh this is my work kind of thing? Um, well, if it ends up being the final piece, I can release it when. Um, when the studio says, says it's, it's okay to be released. Yeah. Um, when it's something that kind of ended up on the floor, I have to kind of double check with the 
studio and or the uh, movie poster agency that I worked with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it depends. I mean, it, the, some 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 agencies are a little touchy about presenting work that didn't make it to the end, but um, I feel like I can sort of fit through a loophole with certain projects because they are illustrated and not using photography. So it really depends on the project. Each, each project has their own set of rules. Yeah. Um, is it, have you got, what's your favorite piece that never made it through to the, to the actual uh, use in marketing? Oh boy. Because where the wild things are, those two pieces are really nice. And your description okay. of the connection between the two characters Thank is it, I, I looked at those two and I thought, I swear I've seen those in the cinema when the film came out. <laughs> um yeah, I mean I was so excited to work on that project. I mean, obviously I'm a, a Spike Jones fan. Um I've I've been a fan of his since he was doing like skate videos. And so um when that project came up, I was, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for a more perfect project to work on. Um, the only issue was that I was brought onto the project way later in the game. And because they had such amazing photography to work with, um, I saw that basically everything had been done, you know? And so at that point, I really had to kind of Photoshop and create these scenes that, that didn't already exist. But, um, at the end of the day, too, um, because it was like a Warner Brothers film, they really wanted to market market it to a broader audience. So mm -hmm. I can see how my pieces felt a little bit too quiet, even though I felt it was appropriate for the film. It it wasn't appropriate for the marketing that they were after. Yeah, and um, there's a there's a lovely piece, and there was a there's actually a little feature in uh, the Illusionist, uh, the darker uh, image from the Illusionist with uh, Ed Norton. Um, was that influenced by F is for fake? Have you ever seen that with uh, Orson Welles? Because the gloves are exactly the same. And some of the early uh, pictures of Welles, it just kind of reminded me of that in a really positive way. Oh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't see that. Because he, I... he, he put kind of uh, the, fil the films, it's a really odd, broken film. And a lot of later uh, Welles' career is, is kind of all over the place because he had so many ideas. Uh, but it was about a... Uh, an illusionist whether the film was real or not and uh, it was just that just a little feature of the gloves in that poster that kind of reminded me of that um, no well I'm glad it, it reminded you of something in a good way <laughs> yeah. and that's what I liked about um, the Paul Dano film is that there's some kind of inner warmth in those in those pieces of art that connect you to uh, the people because when you see a huge movie poster and i won't speak to disparagingly of anyone but sometimes it can get a little bit generic but when you see something that you have a real instant connection with or when you see the film and it's an accurate representation i know what you were saying about you know they're trying to draw you in but when it's when it's a real representation like the coen brothers work you've done as well it it makes so much sense and it kind of reminds you of the film in a really positive way great well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's always a challenge too. Is 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 representing the film, and and wanting to to do it in a creative way, but still, you know, still answering to your bosses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there any kind of? Do you have any kind of happy accidents when you do design work or when you've uh, done a painting for something like when you did the colossal piece? Was that something that was or, always intended, the kind of the hair, but it's actually the legs of the, the, the monster? Yeah, you know, I mean, when I was watching the film, I mean, I, I had so many other ideas too, but my first one, when I figured out how to do the optical illusion of both the, the monster and her hair, I was just doodling and I was like so excited about it. And um you know, I think it was also because I was just watching the film and going, oh, I've never seen Anne Hathaway with bangs, you know, <laughs> like it was just this, this little thought that popped into my head. And I'm like, wait a minute, how can I use this? And then once I kind of figured out that it could make the silhouette, I was like, oh, I got it. And so I, I presented it to Neon and it was the first idea I presented to them. And they're like, this is awesome. Let's do it. 
And I was so excited that they went with this minimalist approach because it couldn't have worked with any other way, uh, painting style. Um, oftentimes some client will be like, I love this idea, but let's paint it realistically. And I'm like, well, if we paint it realistically, it's not, the trick's not going to work. Right. So um, they were really open to the style and how simple it was. And, and it was a project that just went so quickly. They're like, all right, let's do it. Let's print it. And I was like, oh, I can't believe that just happened. Yeah. So, I mean, it was definitely a really fun project. And, and I love how, you know, even if you don't see the film, you might just be like, oh, I appreciate the, the minimalist um, use of this, you know, but then once you see it and once you figure it out, I, I love when someone comes back to it and was like, oh, I see it now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's definitely something um, I like to do when I can. I mean, I did that for a portrait of a lady on fire. Um, you know, I was happy that people loved that poster for just thinking it was a flame. But when people finally saw the profiles to come back to it, I mean, I, and have that aha moment, I was like, all right, great. You know, I'm glad people saw it. People yeah. saw other things in it too, but at that point it just became like a Rorschach test, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I found that with the, um, when I looked at the Point Break piece, was that, was that for a charity, wasn't it, the Point Break poster? That was for a charity, yeah. But I love that. It was so simple having the surfboard on top of the gun. I love that. Thank you. Um, but that must be such a joyous moment when, it's like when you do an edit for a short film, is that when, when a sequence comes together, it's like, oh, that works really well. I can't see any reason to change that. Mm -hmm. And it, it must be quite an enjoyable process. And yet, obviously, you're showing it, you're producing it for a client or for a filmmaker. Um, is there any, do you have any moments where you thought something, yeah, that's great. And then you've you've sent in the, the, the initial design, you're really happy with it, and they've kind of rejected it straight away. Oh yeah, all the time. I think that happens more than it doesn't. That's why I'm like surprised when certain things do make it to the end, like Colossal or a Portrait of a Lady on Fire. You know, like there are so many times I'm like, oh, I wish they would just do this. I can, I know I can already see it in my head and, and I know it's going to be great, but you know, it, you build, you build thick skin being in this industry. And, and I never feel like ideas are completely thrown into the trash because I somehow always kind of keep an archive of certain con concepts. And um, when that perfect movie pops up where I can kind of do a version of that concept, um, I'm, I'm happy that it's there. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of an, oh, okay. So um, the poster for, um, why am I drawing a blank? There, I've, I've been pitching this idea to do, um, where it looks like you're looking outside of a, a, a rainy window. And I pitched it for so many different ideas where I'm like, this would be amazing, you know? And um, of course they, they all got turned down, but then the perfect project came up and I was able to do it and, and I was so happy. So, so yeah, they're never completely trash. They're just kind of kept in here for different iterations later down the road. Oh, so you kind of all, sometimes have an idea of something really nice you'd like to to work on and for it to work and then be don't see the quite quite the right project and then something comes along and then oh that i had that idea two years ago and now it works really well for this yeah exactly yeah. that's incredible um so i want to ask you what's it like when you're working on something that's really quite big like the deadpool uh, the deadpool 2 poster mm -hmm. because that must have been a much larger kind of entity and different people you're working with yeah, it was. And, and I was actually really excited to, to work on that because I'm so used to working on titles that when my, my family asks me what I'm working on, they're like, oh, great. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. And so to actually work on, you know, a, a piece that people would know, but also uh, a piece that I could have fun with, you know, especially Deadpool, which is, you know, less conventional Marvel film. And, and so, um, it was really fun and, and it was fun that um, that they were so willing to take risks uh, and print so many different posters for for the advertisement for the film. So yeah. I was really happy about that. That was fun. That's the beauty of that particular movie with, you know, breaking the fourth wall. You can do, you've almost got a complete freedom in many ways, especially the marketing of that film is, is unique compared to a lot because there's a lot of detail from a piece that's, 
so complicated like that, what's your kind of starting point? Do you have certain things you need to hit on? Yeah, I mean, we definitely wanted to reference Animal House. So, um, so it took, a, you know, there were a lot of little scenes happening all over the place. And so, you know, it took a long time to do and there were revisions amongst the little scenes. But um, every single situation had to be approved before moving forward. So, um, you know, with all the X-Men and all the characters from Deadpool 2, it was just a lot, <laughs> a lot to do. But we, we got it done and it got printed. So that, I'm happy about that. Um, that that's a gr it's a great reference. And I didn't get that straight away, but I know the Animal House poster really well. And yeah. that's a really nice kind of connection. Do you have from... Did, were you interested in kind of movie art, movie posters before you started in this? I wasn't actually. I mean, I was I was always interested in film. I've I you know um, I remember when I first moved to New York and I didn't know anybody. I would just go to the theater and I would just watch film after film. Sometimes I'd sneak into a second one, you know, multiple times a day because that's all I knew at that point. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I, I'd always had a. A strong interest in indie films. I loved indie films, you know, starting in high school. I was always kind of uh, interested in unconventional films. But then I also love like broad comedies. And, you know, so I, I like all types of films. And, and I think that's what's so fun about my job is that every project is so different from the previous one. And so it never gives me a chance to be kind of a one trick pony. I always have to kind of switch gears and, 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 and think, you know, okay, if we're doing a comedy, I need to kind of hit these marks. Whereas with something more independent, you know, it, it just changes. It changes your your way of thinking per project, which is which is fun. It keeps things exciting. So, from when you kind of kind of look, fell in love with uh, cinema and going to the cinema in New York when uh, you wanted to kind of uh, kind of get away quite a bit, um, did you do you have any kind of favorite posters or from other designers like uh, Drew Struzan or any other uh, that, that kind of connected with you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's hard not to be connected to Drew Scruzan posters because especially during the time when I started paying attention to posters, um, those seem to be more or less more of the illustrated ones you would see. And it's hard not to be nostalgic about them. Um, I also was, I remember my dad was very much into James Bond. So I remember looking at an old James Bond poster. Yeah, painted paintings, really, were yeah. painted up until Roger Moore. So those definitely, you know, struck a note with me. Um, and But then once I started kind of paying attention more and more, I really started loving Bob Peake's movie poster work because I saw that he was so versatile and he was able to kind of switch his way of painting to, to match the different genre of film. And so I think that kind of became more of my influence over the years because I felt it was really important to be respectful to the film and, and not just do a painting for the sake of painting, to, to have everything have a reason. Even, even in the way that it's painted, it should, there should be a purpose behind it that somehow connects back to the film. So that's, I, that's what makes sense with the colo uh, colossal uh painting is that the brush strokes themselves it makes complete sense that it was painted and if that was digital it would look it wouldn't look right the tone wouldn't be right yeah it wouldn't feel as like grungy or grimy right exactly yeah, yeah. um so yeah it's uh well thank you very much for uh being part of this and what did you think when we uh we asked you to be part of this um, my first thought is like, oh crap, I have to talk <laughs> so <laughs> all the time, but, um, but no, it, it's fun. It, it's, it's, it's nice to, to talk to people, um, because, you know, especially as movie poster designers, we're just so in our own zones and we're just huddled in front of computers all day. So to hear people appreciate it. It's so kind. It's so wonderful. And, and it kind of recharges my battery, you know, because yeah. half the time I'm like, oh, why do I do this? Who cares? But to, to have people like you guys care about it and, and, and be curious about it. I'm like, okay, I guess it is a fun job. I, you know, I can do it for a little bit longer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the one last piece I wanted to talk about was uh, blue ruin because I, I, I saw that years ago, but I hadn't seen that particular one sheet. Was that one sheet used in the marketing? It was, it was, 
It was a because secondary. Because a, a, a lot of the one sheets aren't used in the UK. It's usually the quad posters, the 30 by 40 inches. Okay. Um, so was that a film you saw? The Did you see the, fini the finished article? I did. I did see the finished film. Yeah. And that, for me, that's probably one of the closest pieces that, yeah, this is an Akiko uh, Sternberger piece because of the way it's so kind of connect. Like what did uh, Joe, Joe Talbot say? It's from the heart of the film. It makes complete sense, you know. And uh, so I, you know, anyone that's watching, go and check uh, Akiko's website out as well. Um, yeah, we're going to keep this as a, a really fun process for you as well. So uh, I'm going to put a little uh, video promo together for you and we're going to post on Instagram, but I'm going to send it to you before it's posted to make sure you're happy with it. Oh, uh, so I'm going to use some of the artwork and I use the little profile photo you sent to us. So um, Yeah, the one that I sent you, that's like three gigs big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, Nadia, if she if he, he told you, but he's like, send me a picture. And then I sent like a huge photo. And I didn't realize it until I was replying back to one of his post uh, his emails and saw how big it was coming up. And I'm like, oh my God, you guys can see my pores. What am I doing? This is something my dad would do. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. Uh, but no, thank you very much. We're going to make our little, uh, uh, your announcement uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I'm going to spend the day putting a little promo together and then I'll send it to you. Um, I won't post it until you, you kind of approve it. So, um, oh, thank well, thank you very much, Akiko. And we'll keep you up to date throughout the process. You won't be berated with emails. You won't have them every day or anything, but uh, we'll make it a really fun process. And yeah, thank you very much. And thanks to Nadia as well for uh, joining me on this. Uh, Nadia and I have been friends for, uh, what, 10 oh, wow, now. years now? Something yeah. like that. Basically, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we worked on a uh, two festivals last year: uh, the Hellbound Horror Festival mm -hmm. and the Isolation Film Festival. Uh, the Hellbound Festival, we had uh, Joe Alves, who's the production designer of Jaws and Close Encounters, as a judge, and wow. we had uh, Alex Proyas as well, the director of The Crow. Um, so we've 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 been really lucky over the last uh, two years, uh, just over a year, uh, between a year and two. Uh, with our judges and you're kind of part of that now Akiko and we wanted to have someone completely different in terms of where how they approach the uh, the film industry and mm -hmm. I think people are going to respond to to your involvement really really well well thank you no I appreciate you guys having me and it's been a pleasure speaking with you guys so thank you and I love that uh video is it with your son on your Instagram about send nudes it was the thing with the ball <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were having fun. We were bored. Uh, we had all these moving boxes because my, my ex-boyfriend was moving out. And so I was like, let's, let's make something out of this. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were constantly making these little marble pathway, fun little things for him. And so, yeah, we had fun with it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, Akiko, is it Sterenberg? I just want to make sure yeah. I get that right. Yeah. Well, thank you for being our first judge. Oh, our second judge, we'll send you a link to him. He's called uh, Garth Austin. He's a documentary filmmaker from South Africa. Oh, and he cool. works in uh, with uh, rhinos and elephants for conservation purposes. And wow. he's a really talented filmmaker. And the first thing I saw of his work, he was actually uh, scratching the chest of a rhino because it was next to him in this conservation space in South Africa. And he was told to do that so it wouldn't kind of knock him over or kill him. So yeah, I'll so we'll send you a little chest scratch. Yeah, he was just on the leaf. He's got this huge camera on his own on this tripod in the middle of, in the middle of South Africa, and he said, "Yeah, do this, do this," and it just literally walked away. Then, oh my gosh, well, that's good so, to know in case anyone ever meet a rhino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right no, he's uh, he's one of your fellow judges. So uh, yeah, really, we really appreciate your involvement, Akiko. This is it's fantastic for us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Okay, okay. We'll, okay. we'll we'll see you soon, and thank you very much again. Thank you again. Uh, All right. See you now. Have a good Bye. rest Bye. of your evening and night. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. See you now. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.